So yeah. by about, um, so now we're going towards the end of uni, this is about 2005, 2006. I've got my own place, I've got my own job. Essentially, I'm my own person. And by this time, there's some unconscious things I had done that were helping me thrive in, in, in a new society, in, in my new home. And one of them being adjusting my language and adjusting how I spoke. Because I realized that while I was at uni, because your children I don't really care and there's so many international students, I was getting away with, with talking the way I spoke and, and, you know, occasionally repeating myself, uh, but then that was not a big deal. But fast forward into the workplace, I realized that my strong Ugandan accent was making me repeat myself multiple times. And I had to say something three times before. What, 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 what? Then I realized it's, it's the way I talk. Like everyone else will adjust to it among my friends, but the workplace is not going to give me that benefit of the doubt every single time. Hello, and welcome to another Live Quality Conversation on the Live Quality Podcast. And today joining me once again is Paula. We've had Paula on before, uh, so no need for an elaborate introduction. Uh, so we'll just jump straight into it and see where it goes. So welcome Paula once again. It's always a pleasure to talk to you on these things. Thank uh, you. Yeah, so you know, how have you been? How, what have you been thinking about? What have you been reading? <laughs> Or working I've on. Been, <laughs> I've been really well. Thanks for having me again. Uh, I haven't been reading anything outside of my day job, but I have been working on a lot of stuff. I'm starting to work on my um, my little side passion hustle, hustle for the timber work, and then I'm starting to build a shed and try and get a bit of my personality out on an Instagram page somewhere soon. Yeah. Uh, the the projects that's good last time we spoke about uh creating time for creativity like becoming creative with time making time and then mm. you know lining up things uh so that they can kind of like feed into each other so you can get to do more of the things that you like uh so i was wondering today like you know we, we both uh you'd say living in a place where we didn't grow up <laughs> yeah. that's how i would phrase it i don't like using mm -hmm. those labels because man yeah. the different people interpret them differently yeah yeah but like uh, like growing up in uh, living in a place where you haven't grown up has can have like a big impact on you because you have to relearn things that uh, mm. you probably already knew how to do and now have to relearn them do them differently uh even even speaking, you have to learn to speak differently. You have to, uh, like if you're a parent, the parenting you got <laughs> worked, but in the context in which you were growing up. Uh, yes. but when you're in a different place, that mm. parenting, you can't just transfer. It's, you have to kind of like interpret it and fit it in the new uh, situation where mm. you find yourself. Mm. So yeah so like i know many people many of us who are going through some of the things and working through that readjusting and i was curious how has that been for you and uh what are some of the things that you have had to like reshape relearn readjust mm -hmm. learn to do differently and yeah we can we can start from there and then see where we go <laughs> okay i guess for me to make it contextual i'll start from choosing a new place to call home rather than use the labels that might put you know a bit of a different spin on things so 24 years ago i decided to choose a new home and when i made that decision i don't think it was entirely conscious that i was deciding for the rest of my life i made a decision to go leave home and go study somewhere else and for me, I actually chose the furthest place from anyone I knew. And the reason being, I was 18 and I wanted my freedom and independence. And I wanted to be away. So my parents gave me options. And I looked on the map and I thought, Australia is in there. I don't know anything about Australia, but this is where I'm going to call home. So everyone at the time said to me, are you sure? It's so far from everyone and anything you know. 
Are you sure? I'm like, that's precisely why I want it. It's so far removed from everyone and anything I love. So off I came. And then I did the university. And long story short, from year one to year four, all I did was study and start to find out who I was. And that was my first lesson. And my first lesson in in molding myself in a way that would fit this new home. Mm. And that lesson was, for the first time in my life, I didn't have people telling me who I was. I only had my mind. And all of a sudden I was thinking, and I was thinking about paying rent, I was thinking about paying bills, I was looking at my money and my expenses, and it wasn't nothing. And all of a sudden, I didn't have mom and dad to run to. I didn't have an auntie to call or to go and visit because I knew in that setting, everything was covered off. And instantly, I was an adult. I was 19 years old by the time I got here and an adult. And I was thinking through, oh my goodness, how do I navigate this thing? What, what do I do? Like, what is it going to be? And then somehow I started to to emerge as this young adult who was fending for herself and learning new things. And you know, I think the beauty of having come away and started to grow is I can actually think back and see where my evolution came from, like the different eras of my life where I started to see a person evolve. Mm. So for the first four years of my life, let's just call that the budding phase where I was confused and the struggles I had the most were around religion mm. and, you know, going to church every Sunday. And when I stopped going to church every Sunday, how that affected me and how that affected my relationship with my parents because all of a sudden I wasn't meeting this expectation that they had and I had guilt. But I was far removed from them that I could stand on my own two feet and say this is not what I want to do. So in this, this budding phase, I learned a bit about money, I learned about religion, I learned about um, actually saying no and managing my time. I learned about um, communicating. And, you know, I can distinctly remember my parents sending me money to meet my tuition fees and then my living expenses. And it was September of September of 2001 when for the first time it hit me that I was dependent on what they gave me and I had no more outside of that. So if I went to the shops and they said I wanted to buy a dress, instantly it was either a dress or dinner. And I was fighting that, that, that battle. And I remember thinking to myself, I can't, I need more than this. Yeah. Yeah. So the first conversation I had with my parents, I came in February, so that's, February to September, that's seven months is the first time I realized that my, if my life was fine based on, on what my parents could give me. And I remember having the conversation with my parents and saying, oh, you know, um, I have to pay this, this and this. And their question was, do you have enough money? And I said, no, but they're like, what do you mean? Do you have enough? How much more do you need? And in that conversation, Claire, I felt guilt. I felt guilt because the more I was asking for was more than living. It was going into the entertainment, into the, the wants category rather than the needs. And I sat there and thought, who am I going to be that I'm now wanting my parents to cover more than they should, especially knowing the cost of that extra? Yeah, yeah we you know, think about the exchange rate, you think about the different economies. So there I was in this budding phase, just struggling with these things I couldn't articulate. And then a few months into that, by November, so September, by November, when they'd ask me, do you have enough? I would say, yeah, I have more than enough. And I didn't have enough. And I remember there's some nights I went without dinner or I'd choose a meal. Either I had lunch and didn't have dinner, or I'd have dinner and not have lunch. Oh, I started going to places that sold bulk food to get sick chicken wings. That was like a staple of mine and noodles. So I started to say I had more than enough. 
because I wanted the stress to come off them. And as time went, so by that November holiday or uni, I started to ask around what other students did. And then I found out about um, cotton chipping and how, you know, all these people would go to a farm, they'd work there, get some money and then come back and, you know, they could pay their bills. So I said to my parents, you know what? From now on, you just send me tuition fees. I leave the rest to me. I will, I will make it work. And they're like, are you sure? I'm like, yeah, I'll make it work. Are you sure? And I was not sure at all. But the adult, the budding adult had to say, yes, I'll make it work. But I, I, I just said to them, but look, if I get in trouble, I'll definitely let you know. <laughs> so fast forward, I started working. I went cotton shipping. I went from there and I got all sorts of odd jobs and, and it worked. I started making my own money and I'd pay my rent. I didn't have to ring home to ask for anything. And it was such a scary, but good place to be in. Yeah. So as time went on, I started to unpack a lot of these things and one being the religion, that was a big one for me. And I started to sit down quietly with myself and think through what it meant for me not to go to hell as this, this yeah. budding adult, like this newfound freedom and new space to think, am I walking myself straight into hell or am I expanding and challenging what I didn't know so that I'm becoming someone else and someone new, someone better, someone I want, someone I like. And again, I went through this this mm, upheaval in my life and, and like not knowing, but at the same time, managing to stay in this place and start to feel like it's home. Mm. So by about, um, so now we're going towards the end of uni, it's about 2005, 2006, I've got my place, I've got my own job, Essentially, I'm my own person. And by this time, there's some unconscious things I had done that were helping me thrive in, in, in a new society, in, in my new home. And one of them being adjusting my language and adjusting how I spoke. Because I realized that while I was at uni, because you're children, I don't really care, and there's so many international students, I was getting away with, with talking the way I spoke and and, you know, occasionally repeating myself, uh, but then that was not a big deal. But fast forward into the workplace, I realized that my strong Ugandan accent was making me repeat myself multiple times. And I had to say something three times before, what, 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 what? Then I realized, oh, it's, it's the way I talk. Like everyone else will adjust to it among my friends, but the workplace is not going to give me that benefit of the doubt every single time. So then I started learning to code my speech and having to to slow down some words and, you know, cut out some letters here and there and, and you know, just change my way of speaking so that I, I could fit. And to my benefit, it started to take on. I stopped repeating myself enough. Like I started to have this thing where even if someone didn't understand me, for example, I could make a, make fun of it and say, it's just the accent, don't worry about it. And, you know, just brush it off because really it wasn't a big deal. It's like, this is who I am. But one thing I do remember at the time when it came to the language is there would be acknowledgement that, oh, you speak good English. And I would have to educate and say, yes, we are a former British colony and you know, we're brought up speaking English, and but the comments always be, you write really well. Yes, we're brought up speaking and writing English, so it's not that, you know, we're foreign to the, the concept. It might be a third, fourth language, but it's, it's primary in that we're expected to do it as part of school. So it was then, you know, like slowly other things start creeping in, like, you know, relationships, and, and friends and cultural practices and explaining, you know, like, what's your name? Paula Bagumera. Sorry, what was that? Paula Bagumera. Or Paula Mumza Bagumera, if you ask me for my full name. What's that? I'm like, okay. And I'll start backing up. Paula, my middle name is Mumza, it means. And my surname is Bagumera, it means. 
And then I would get people quite like, oh, it means that. I'm like, yeah. And I'd start to educate. In Africa, we'd have a strong belief in the significance and the meaning behind the name. So you're conscious on how you choose that name and how it's going to take you through. Some people get to a point where they don't like that name anymore and they change it. So I found myself in this place where I was assimilating in a new society, but I also wasn't willing to let go of mine. And I had to find a place to marry these two things because they were two big parts of who I was. I wasn't willing to leave, but I wasn't willing to forget either. So I had people say to me, oh, that's interesting. And for example, Mahomza, which would translate to giver of rest. And they started to make fun of it. I'm like, you see, I'm quite peaceful. I bring you lots of peace, you know? Yeah, I'm a rest giver. Like, oh, here you are. You've got such a beautiful personality about you. And I'm like, you might not even mean it, but because I've given you something to talk about my background on, you're actually yeah. embracing it and taking it on. And for me, that was a good thing. I was like, there's so many beautiful things about where we come from that many people don't get to experience or to understand or to know. So I was now in a place to this day, anyone that encounters me, if we get to work together for a while, I try to bring in my background and I try mm -hmm. to bring in those things that make me who I am, that they will never ever know without me pointing out. Yeah. You know, my hair, for example, is a big discussion topic. Everyone looks at your hair, I'm like, yeah, what is it? Are they little plants? Do you sit down and do them every morning? No. So I have to explain to them. And, you know, I'm like, you know, an African woman, our hair is something very important to us. And it's important because we grow up maybe not feeling comfortable in our skins over our hair. And we have to conform constantly and be told maybe it's not professional looking. Maybe it is. And for a long time, I was caught up in that trend where society didn't accept my hair the way it was in this big afro so i had to to tone it down to make everyone else comfortable but then the decision to wear dreadlocks is an embracing of who i am it's more like this is me this is my hair this is my natural hair how it comes so if you're going to know me and accept me if you're going to stop by judging my hair and let it stop there then that's that's entirely up to you but for me, I'm going to present in my true state. And Uncle Claire can't tell you how many times I look at how people respond to me because of the dreadlocks without them listening to what is being said. Yeah. And I'm sitting there going, wow, what, what an interesting concept that judgment is going to be on anything, whether I have it up in an afro, whether I have it back in straight, whether I have it hanging down, People will judge me for it. Yeah. And you know, it, it takes someone aware to look past those things and just hear what you have to say and embrace you for who you are. So for me, this, this is more than a statement of, of, this is my preferred hairstyle, but it is actually a statement of, this is who I am. You will take mm -hmm. me as I come. I am wonderful in all aspects. This is how I'm going to present and the freedom that comes with it in this space, but also from my background, my culture, where we've been programmed to think it's not okay. But again, I'm bringing that here. It's my culture. This is my home. This is where I'm going to stay. This is where I built a family and made friends. This is home now. So there are two homes and I'm going to marry them, constantly trying to bring them together so that who I am is comfortable in my skin, in this new new home. I know there's so many small things that I'm sure you do as well, that you don't realize are testaments of who you are from somewhere else, that most people will probably look at and go, oh, that's different. That's different, yeah. you know? And I, I don't know if you have, I'm sure you have comments to say because I've said so much, but there's so many beautiful things in this cultural journey of, of merging two worlds that we have, we don't even stop to acknowledge. 
yeah it's it is wow you've, you've said so much there it's mm. like <laughs> we're going to be here for a while <laughs> <laughs> i have <love> time today <laughs> <laughs> yeah mm. so yeah the way you've painted that journey is really beautiful and it deeply resonates with me and my own as well you know mm. and my one may not be as long as yours, uh, but uh, it's it's a very similar experience, I would say. Because uh, those first, I think, two, three years, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of uh, who am I <laughs> in this new scenario, right? Uh, mm-hmm. You touched on that thing of where you lose the people who told you who you are, right? And when, when you're with the people who tell you who you are, it's not a big deal, right? It's like, you're just who you are. And Mm -hmm. there's a few reinforcements happening here and there. It's like, oh, no, you're not this. Every time you try to go off the rails, like, no, 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 you're not this, you're you're this. Please Mm -hmm. maintain who you are. And so there's a lot of people helping in maintaining your sanity of who you are. Mm -hmm. Now, the moment you know, you're ripped out of that setting and you have to rebuild it. All of a sudden you have a new challenge because now remember like for you to get that, let's say community where you are growing, where you had all these people, you know, your, your close relatives, friends, you know, people within the, the community and the society, like you just grew into that. Like there was no choice here. You didn't mm-hmm. know it was happening. It was you're not very aware of it as yeah. it was happening. Yeah. It's like when you came to awareness, it was already there. <laughs> mm-hmm. But now it's like time has been reversed, and now you have to do it afresh. And and now that you have like your own consciousness and your own shape of how you see things all of a sudden your preferences are coming into play. It's like, ah, maybe I don't want that. Maybe I, mm-hmm. this I dislike, I, I would rather this over yeah. that. Mm. And as you do that, you quickly realize how overwhelming that yes. is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes, no, seriously. Mm. <laughs> it becomes so overwhelming because like for me, uh, Cause like we moved 2016, right? And round about, I think round, I think it happened. The experience of it wasn't as fast as it happened, right? Like mm-hmm. for me, that feels like so long ago, but it's really not. Yeah. <laughs> Cause mm. I remember like a couple of years later, I was like really falling into this crisis almost, you'd say like of what things are or how things should be. Mm. Yeah, like the, and I've told this story before, but like there was this point in time when I just came to the realization that we were we happened to be in much better circumstances as a family. Because like for me, fortunately, I moved with the family. So the circumstances were different. It's like, oh, okay, you make, you, 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 you're making a little bit more money. You have more access to you know, things and luxuries. And so the assumption is, therefore, you should have a good life, right? Like life should be good. Yeah. But but that wasn't the case because like you come back home and you, you know, there's no that excitement of like, it was more the drug of like, oh, home again, <laughs> right? And, mm-hmm. and you get there and people are sad, uh, there isn't much to talk about. It's like life was, the quality of life was dull. And, and it, it, yeah. it did my head in because it was like, no, no, statistically speaking, it mm-hmm. should be better. Like it, there are all these improvements. Why is, why does it not feel better? Yeah. And, and like, so when was I around? Probably towards the end of 2017 like i it started to like really stand out for me i'm like why 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 is it why are we sad at home Mm. and and it kept you know knowing at me and 
I think within 2018, I was asking so many questions of myself, mm -hmm. contemplating, do I, you know, because like I would find myself going for extra work, right? Like, you know, you, you do extra chores at work or pick up extra things that you, you don't need to, you're, you're not required to, but you can. And so, and I realized this eventually later. It's like, wait, no, I was picking that extra work up just to probably not go home because I was not excited to get back home. So I was just yeah. finding other things to keep myself busy. You know, you go for Hi. at the time I went for, yeah, like, you know, mm -hmm. I would go for hackathons. We, we did like a whole marathon of hackathons. Uh, so over, even over the weekend, you had things to do because, you, you know, having a thing to do is exciting. It keeps, it keeps mm -hmm. the worries away. Like it keeps your mind away from the things you should actually be dealing mm -hmm. with. Mm. And I didn't want to deal with those problems. And I'm like, no, I'll just go do this thing. I'll just go do this thing. This is, I, this, I know what I'm doing. This is, yeah. easy. I can, I can see the outcome. I can see the progress. And for a while you go down that route and then, but you can't escape it for long. But then you, you know, I still come back to it. I'm contemplating. I'm like, wait, was it a wrong decision to move to a different place? Like, but mm -hmm. on paper it looks right. It's like, but we are not we're not <laughs> happy about this. Yeah. Eh, okay, may, maybe it's not. And then but what's my role in this, right? Like all these questions are coming up. What's mm -hmm. my role in this? Well like me as a as a you know, as a father, as a husband, as as the the the, the, the caretaker of my people, I think I have done <laughs> well. Like mm -hmm. I have found a way to increase our resources and have a more stable environment. Have I not solved my problems? Mm -hmm. And you, and this, as I was stuck in my face, like, no, you haven't. <laughs> yeah. Cause like, I'm, I'm coming back home to a sad wife. And they're like, is it, is it the relationship? Is it not working? It's like, but it's working. Like, it, but you know, the things which are not working. Yeah. But you know, we, we even sat down and spoke about it and like, could we be, could we have come to the end of this? Mm. And, you know, for her, she says, no, like, you know, relationships are like that. Life happens, you know, you have downs, mm -hmm. you have ups. But in my head, I'm going like, no, it can't be like, we should be solving yeah. it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. The, 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 at the time, I'd only delve in. So, so you come back home, the child is distressed, you don't understand. It's like, I have these people I'm caring for, but I don't understand mm -hmm. why they are not. <laughs> it's like, why, why are they not picking up? Why, why, why are they not re <laughs> flourishing? Yeah. Right? And so, after contemplating a lot about it, eventually, I think I got an opportunity that year in 2018 uh well looking back now you see it as an opportunity <laughs> yeah mm. uh, my my brother-in-law was getting married and so uh fiona wanted to go and attend and so she planned to go for like a trip of three months back back home and she offered to take the oven along and it's like oh so i was on my own it's like yeah great maybe this will be enough <laughs> time for me to think things freedom, through, yeah? right? <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. freedom. <laughs> so, off they go, and alone I am. And at the time, I really spend a lot of time reading lots of books, going through people's works, like really trying to solve such and see what is what is not working for me, and what's what should be working. And mm -hmm. then now I fell into, you know, un unpacking all those things that you know you know, the religion, right? It's like, what, are, what, where do I stand with that? Because at, at first when you're home, it's like, you just do what, what you're being told, what everybody else is doing, you just go with the flow, right? But now you realize, uh, no, actually, I have to make my own choice here. I have to like really understand what I'm dealing with and know what I'm getting myself into. Mm. Right? Maybe, you know, so you start to get into that. It's like my... At the time, I think the other thing I was exploring was my personality. Like, what kind of person am I, right? Well, oh why do I tend to, yeah? You know, what do mm -hmm. I tend, how, how do I respond? Why do I respond the way that I respond? Like, because mm -hmm. you find, at the time, you, I would find myself a lot in scenarios where, like, 
why why did I do that or how, why did I respond that way and mm. you don't know why but you see yourself in a pattern stuck in a pattern and so slowly uh, I think going because going through works of uh, like, like I went through many people but off the top of my head at the time I think uh, there was the whole going through Sam Harris's body of work mm. and, you know trying to understand the free will thing because he had done a lot of stuff about that then I found uh, Jordan Peterson's stuff went through that went through his lectures then as I was going through that uh, there was this guy Eckhart Tolle and he has also quite a number of uh, work on, on in those areas. Uh, mm. es- Esther Perel, who, like, going through all those those people's works, slowly starts to give me a perspective that I had not even thought I needed to work on or even cultivate. Mm. And, and then, around then, I think towards the end of that year, when these guys came back, I had sort of, like, I made a radical choice. I was like, you know what? Um, I think I'm in a different situation. I'm in a different game completely. I have mm-hmm. to play differently. So I have to reset and start again. And even making that realization was so sad because you're mourning <laughs> what you're yeah. sort of like missing, you know? Yeah, like you hear a lot of people. Yeah, yeah, it's like, oh, if I was back home... Uh, I would not have to do this and this and this. So if I was back home, life would be this way. It's like, yeah, yeah, you're not. <laughs> mm. Be okay with it. And I'll figure out where you are and how to be there. And move on, yeah. Yeah. And so starting on that journey of, you know, trying to understand. It's like that's when I remember telling you, I was like, oh, wait. Uh, so speaking, I've come to realize I have to like really slow down sometimes because... You guys won't get it. Apparently, I have an accent. It's like I didn't think I had one. It's like, yeah, you do. <laughs> right? Yeah. Then, you know, but here's the funny thing: like when you travel back home and you speak, I say, "Wait, you're speaking with a strange accent." It's like, no yeah, they have to switch like, out of it. Yeah. It's like, wait, now, now I have to switch back. Yeah, it's like mm. relearning all these things and reshaping yourself for because now you're no longer the person who grew up where you grew up and you're not really a person of where you are you're like like a new blend right <laughs> like a new blend mm-hmm. <laughs> recently recently I was, i've started to do like painting right as you no know, and there's this thing you do like if you're like there's a there's a dark color and there's a light color there's like a color in between but you really can't recreate it Mm. so there's there's a technique where you paint them on and then you have to blend them and if you blend them and smooth them out like it will look like the the, the new color will happen but Mm. you you can't manually create it (laughs) so Mm. you just have to put the two things together and then they will smooth each other out and yeah and so it's like we are that car part in the middle, the, the, the color that's blending, that's mm. that no one else can make, that hasn't been there, that wasn't, and it's yeah. it's like a very unique, particular scenario we're in, mm. and it's going to be different for everyone. Um, so, yeah, it's like around then I had to kind of like come to terms with that, and, and first of all, you, you to accept that man. There's a lot of there's a lot of sad things you have to agree with. Like, okay, so this other thing I was looking forward to, I'm not going to get. Mm. You have to reshape your dreams, right? Like I, I, I was I was saying, guys, at the time, uh, oh, it's like we we have our, like growing up back home, you have your Ugandan dreams. Like, you know, grow up, go to uni, finish yeah. uni, find a job, get find married. <laughs> yeah, 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 get married. Uh, start mm-hmm. a family and buy a plot of land, build mm-hmm. a house. And if you can, start a business and then you die. Done. Yeah. Life mm. is complete. It's like that's that's the trajectory. I was saying, guys, like, yeah, it looks like the Ugandan dream no longer works in this situation. Because, like, you're in a different economy. Things work differently here. And all those things, like... Your Ugandan dream can fit in this place like quickly. 
easily. <laughs> but then, then what? Do you, do you have to die then? <laughs> like, uh, you know, now, now you have to expand it, right? <laughs> you know, you think of, of the Ugandan dream and you start to realize that the Ugandan is dreaming of your Australian dream. That even they are not happy with that Ugandan dream. And mm. it... It's really sobering when you think about it. You know, we're programmed to want, 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 and want better. And, it, and that's what it should be. You should always be improving. But right now, when I look at the economy back home, the sadness is, even if you dreamed better, the chances of getting better are so slim. Yeah. And, like, they're so slim that to the extent of even those people you know should be in a better place than you are, or we're in a better place than you are even just a few years ago. Right now, it's either going like that or going like that. It's the anomaly to find anyone still going up that, that way. That, for me, is the saddest part. Like, we all have these dreams, these big goals. But in this setting, you have half a chance of actually doing it. In the setting we come from, it's getting more and more evident that the older we grow, those opportunities are diminishing yeah. and you know when we think as we were talking about this what i was thinking about is our children won't have that different um they won't have that experience if anything it will be the reverse because whenever we take them home they'll always have a sense of not fitting or belonging yeah. and it will be trying to bring a piece of uganda back to them rather than having two to kind of merge. Mm. And if there's anything that I'm, I'm not sure about in the decision to come here and immigrate here and stay here and make this home, it's that. It's, I find myself in a place where even when we grew up, we weren't entirely cultural or entirely traditional because we grew up in, in the cities. We went to your good schools. We, we spoke English. We weren't completely traditional. So what we got from that setting wasn't com the complete picture of our heritage, of our background. And now he here where we are, we only have bits and pieces. And we can only pass on even a little portion of, if this is what I have, I can only pass on so much because yeah. I don't have enough to give. And then my children, when they have children, what are they going to pass on of this heritage it, it's just going to keep diminishing. For me, that's the sad part, I feel. I feel like as much as we're we trying, we are quickly being watered down by the decision to come here and make new homes. And not, not to say that even the one in Uganda is not being watered down, because reality is they are. Influence from social media, from movies, has affected our culture and identity in so many ways that I don't think they're that much better off than we are. But it's the realization that somehow we're losing this really unique part of us, which I don't know whether it's, it's, it's I, I can't even put a name to what it would be, let me just be honest, because I look at other cultures and they're managing to keep up better than we are. Hmm. Do you know what I mean? Like they, they seem to have a better yeah. handle on holding on to their culture and their beliefs and, and their traditions than we as Ugandans or many African countries do. I think it's it's the, the view that whatever is coming from the outside is better than who we are. Mm. So we need to let this go and embrace that, which should be the reverse. We have so much to keep, so much good, so much belief, so much faith. Like... But I find, you know, like there's so many good things, but then there are those sobering things that I, I don't even know how to reconcile after so many years. Yeah, no, you, you're very correct on that one. I, I, it's also for me like something that recently I've like really started to pay a lot of attention to. Yeah. Uh, like I even bought, uh, I found these two books online teaching. I uh, teach your uh, land tutorial. <laughs> mm. Now I'm not 
even but that's the closest <laughs> i yes. can get yeah, right? yeah like somebody out there made a book i'm like okay this is a starting point mm -hmm. um I haven't yet gotten a Rujoro one. No one has probably, yeah. or I haven't found the one for that. But if I get mm -hmm. that one, maybe. But this is not a bad yes, starting so point. Like, like, mm. But it's like going out of the way to actually, it's like, okay, you need to learn the language. You know, you have to pass on the language to the children. Uh, but you also have to, because like they go to school and then they're, they're like here in Australia, they're learning about the, you know, Aboriginal people. Uh, all those tribes, like they even comes and tells us about the tribes they've learned about. Mm -hmm. but then the follow-up question is like, what about me? Who are my ancestors? Where am I from? And um, I've had to do a lot of research, dig up the material and mm -hmm. you know, share the stories with him. And slowly he's starting to, to get into it. And as I was digging up material, I've quickly found that Oh, there isn't a lot of material out there. There's like like snippets and pieces here and there. Mm. And the more you dig deep, it's like, oh, and all these were captured by people who went to visit. They were not like, we didn't tell our own <laughs> stories. Mm. And and then you look back, like I remember the time when uh, we were getting married and you had to do the the traditional wedding. And there are all these customs and norms and all these things are talking about. They were, the experience of it, I was like, they are so annoying. It's like, these things are so backward, right? It's like, why mm. do we have to do that? It doesn't make sense. And now I'm going back. Like, wait, I think I need to go back and reanalyze those things and understand their origin. Mm. Uh, and, uh, and the thing is... I don't think we've had, um, like in our cultures and traditions, like we didn't really have a facet of like an organized way to pass it on to the next generation. Mm -hmm. It was more because like, you know, and you touched on this because like everybody's telling you, you know, who you are, how you are, how you should be. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's this assumption of like, it should be obvious to you like the rest the in between the all that is being implied in between should be mm. obvious to you you should just get it and mm. but actually you just can't get it you the, the, the times now have uh, quickened right like we 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 say it in technology like you know the technology speed doubles every year and that has been the case ever since you know it, 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 the, this domain was open but the thing we don't talk about is that even as the people who use the technology were becoming faster and faster were being shaped by the technology. Yeah. And so now, because things happen really fast and the, and the response is really high, we, we have lost the patience of waiting for things or trying yeah. to understand, waiting for the yeah. meaning to reveal itself. So we, we don't... We, 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 it's very hard. Like to do that, you have to work for that trait or that ability. And now, the 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 whole like our cultures and traditions are not accounting for that, right? Because for things were a certain way and they were going at a certain pace. Yeah. Therefore, if you want them, that's how you get them. Now, for the mm -hmm. modern generations, we go like ah. Oh, those things are too slow. They don't make sense. Can't wait. Uh, yeah, I, we don't have yeah time. I can't wait. Yeah. And, mm. and so the, uh, so the question becomes like, how do we bridge that gap? How do we update the, the cultures and traditions and bring them uh, closer to the modern people, like repackage mm. them for the modern people. And there's a few, there's a few people trying to do this. Uh, I've, I've been researching on that in, in the last, few weeks and i'm finding out like people are doing work on that um and some people are trying and you know they run out of budget or they they get to a place where there's no uptake for it they fail yeah but i think it has to be encouraged and of course like it would be great if institutions are encouraging this but it doesn't matter like if there's a need this this need will have to be filled at some point and 
a lot of work has to be done there. Like those old stories of ours, like those ancient tales, those those traditions need mm. to first be recaptured and re represented like in in modern medium, right? It's like, you know, video, audio. Let like mm. let's have kingdoms <laughs> run their social media pages and, and re emphasize some of these things. But the, the the people in the kingdoms are telling you, I uh, know that the technology is too advanced. We don't know how to do those things, and so the the area of interest I'm finding is like, oh wait, I'm a technologist. I can totally help close some of that gap. So okay, wait, mm-hmm. how how do you reach out to these people? Do you talk to them? Do you find out what projects are they, are they working on? Suggest to them how all technology can make it simpler for them. Um, mm-hmm. So that. You know, this this upcoming generation will benefit from that. Yeah. Say, next time for them, like when Delvin has to do what I'm doing for him, <laughs> for someone else. Reference. Yeah. He'll, yeah, he will have a bit more resources to work with, mm-hmm. and uh, and something like that. But like I was even telling him, I was like, wait, for me, uh, also I learned these things like at school. I had to research for myself. My parents did not sit me down and tell me this stuff. Yeah, <laughs> you know, they, they mm-hmm. just they, they just assumed that I would get it and it would all make sense, yeah. and mm-hmm. and which which then goes back to that whole, you know, like if if you look at it, the the way at least we grow up, you're not, we don't have that, uh, you'd say individuality, a lot mm-hmm. emphasized back home. It's always about your community. It's always about your family and where you fit within that landscape as an individual you're not you you you're not really encouraged to aspire to stand up on your own and you know mm. take ownership of those things and so just, even shifting your thinking to that is so mm. hard right <laughs> just yeah. touching on that way i absolutely love that about our heritage and our, where we come from i mm. love that Yes, we're communal and there's so many things your parents didn't even have to think they had to tell you because you had a friend from a different tribe. You had an auntie, you had a maid, you had someone who was going to influence you and bring you up to speed in that space. Recently, I had a chat with um, Fiona and, and Anthony and we're talking about raising children in this setting where a child does something and you want to tell them, do you see the opportunity you have? Like, wake up. And they're saying to them, like, our children will never understand it the way we did because we see the opportunity because we didn't have as much. Even when you bring a child who was born in Uganda, they're still immature and still childish so that they don't really recognize that as an opportunity because they still have mom and dad. And that's the blessing of it you have a back, something to fall back on. So your first reaction is not going to go, what do I need to hold on to? And look, mm-hmm. there, there are many schools of thought on that. But what I've realized in this setting is here we have both the judge, the jury, the accomplice, the executioner, the comforter, the financier, the doctor, everything. If I was really children back home, I'd come in at the end of the day, I'd find they've had their fights, the maid has stepped in, an older cousin, a friend. Someone has disciplined them, and all I'm coming to do is put my stamp of approval on, you know what? I'm not mm. going to accept that. And I think that's partly where we got the fear of authority growing up. Because for all the bad things you did, the threat was, I'll tell daddy when he comes back. And instantly, you you comply because telling daddy was... Like the final thing, because he knew he'd come in and go, why did you do that? But here, it's the whole day you're observing them and the whole day you're being a part of this silliness. And then they get to a point where they're not listening to you because you've been playing with them all day. And now you have to flip. And even when you flip, you're you're conflicted in yourself because you're like, I was playing with you. Now all of a sudden I want you to change and, you know, listen to me because now it's, it's busy time. And... Some days I do struggle with it, but majority of the time I'm like, this is a challenge. And even my friends in Uganda, when I sit down to talk to them about it, they're like, we don't know how you guys do it. 
doing it all and you know being hands-on in every aspect of your child's growing up and then actually being able to impart manners and behaviors and beliefs that you can stand by and say yeah i wholeheartedly believe this is the right thing to do sometimes they miss the mark we all do and you know just even acknowledge that you know what that's an issue working on it but this this new home we're in forces us to to let go of that thing and embrace it but on the other side of it the counterparts we have in this new home who don't have that as a reference point and they're doing it all and struggling through it and not knowing how to reconcile this parenting place that comes with no handbook We've got the benefit of going, you know what? When we're on as a kid, the maid did this, this, and this. Auntie did this and this. My older cousins filled this and this gap. So you knew where these gaps should be filled from. So you have that reference of, okay, my child is now 17. At this age, I was doing this and this, and such and such did this. Let me try that. And again, it's not everyone, so it, it's, I'm not making a blanket statement, I'm just observing from the people I know that sometimes my counterparts in this new home don't have that reference point. So when they struggle, the struggle seems more painful and the suffering seems a lot. Yeah. And yet it could be minimized by embracing a different approach. So when I talk to people, like I'll talk to some of my friends and I'll be like, in my culture, if me and Clayton are around the same age, Clayton's children are instantly my nieces and nephews. I don't care if, if me and Clayton have no blood relation. They're my nieces and nephews. And if they're in my care, I direct them as I see fit because I'm the adult. Mm. So if I wake up and it's school holidays and I say, hey, Clayton, Fiona, whoever it is, all the children that are in my care, Today we're scrubbing the floors, we're scrubbing the, everything in the house. They have no, they can't say no because it's the way the structure is set up. So when I talk to my friends about all these nieces and nephews that come around and they, I farm off jobs to them that I don't want to do. And then sometimes I might pay them, sometimes I might buy pizza, sometimes I might give them a treat. But it's, it's, a, it's an, an interaction and a community building thing. And sometimes they'll say things like, how do you get them to do all of that? I'm like, it's the tone, I've said so. So the implied respect for your parent is attached to me because I'm the authority at the time. And some of them don't understand how this works. They mm -hmm. don't understand how I can be the mother of two children, a 12 year old and a five year old, but then still command a 25 year old in someone else's home to come and spend the day with my children because I have to go away. So he's like, mm. how do you do it? And I'm always trying to say without saying, it's the culture, it's the difference, it's the beliefs, it's the, the forged family we've made here. And I say that to so many people, like I'll hear someone say, oh God, I'm so frustrated, I'm so tired. I haven't slept in so many days, this and this. And then every so often I dig deeper and I find that and again, no criticism, it's just observations. And I'm not saying one way is better than the other, but I think there are things to learn from each other. When I talk to some of my friends and at the age of 12, which is Sophia's age, you hear that the mother is still making the lunchbox, you know, or still cleaning the room if the child says no, or still having an argument over a phone. And sometimes I'll say, but why do you have that argument? It's get up, clean your room, or I'll throw the things out. If they don't listen, one, two, the third time you actually carry through and throw the things out. Mm -hmm. Like you have to make it so that it's no longer a, a, a negotiation. Oh, but I can't do that because I have to replace them. Then the person doesn't value them if they don't fear they'll lose them. Or something like, my daughter is always on her phone, I can't get her off. I'm like, take it off her. Oh, I can't do that. Why not? Yeah, as long as you're not an adult, you're waiting in my house, I'm paying for that phone bill. If I say, give me the phone, you have no choice but to give it to me. Yeah. Like, 
it's just that and it's not that I'm, I'm beating my children up to comply or I'm torturing them in any way but it's more let's agree on how this thing called hierarchy works and let's agree that I am the top of the pyramid and you are down here I don't have to say it all the time but you must you must know that I'm caring for you and things like that and when I try to explain it to people I'm like in Uganda, where we grew up, if you were on the streets doing something naughty, it didn't matter who was around you. As long as they were an adult, they could clip you. They yeah. could correct you. They could influence you and make you take them to their, your home for them to dub on you. And I'm like, yeah. really? I'm like, yeah. But that's what it means to be community. That's what it means to to choose to get people and say we don't know each other from a bar of soap but let's do this thing together mm. and i think many societies do it well because we're communal so when we come to a foreign home we have no choice but to seek that out but i always like to open people up to that you know yes your culture is very individualistic you do your own thing but have you considered the stress relief there is in mm. just farming out your children to someone for a day? And you know, if Clayton is home, he can have the kids. If Maureen is home, she can have the kids. Then everyone gets a chance to breathe. No yes. one is stressing. And oh, I'm, I'm so envious of you for that. Like, you can do the same thing. It's not, it's not a club that only one person <laughs> can, you know? So it's such a strange place and and so many times I have many many opportunities to sit down and compare and see what's good and what's bad and what I can transfer mm. and what I can't what I need to get from this culture and maybe share somewhere else and it's I find it's such a it's a constant learning that you can't sit down and say now this I've got nailed down path this yeah. doesn't have to change and I find that coming from being born in one place and calling it home when I'm here, the minute I go to that place, all of a sudden Australia is home. I have that new home. Mm. <laughs> and it's a constant back and forth. And, you know, and then I got to a place of going, you know what? It's all home. I'm not going to live in this no man, no man island here, this place where I'm not sure. I'll just refer to both of them as home. And, you know, everyone will understand and i don't know if you find the same but when i go home and in uganda i'll meet relatives and they'll greet me in in my mother tongue and they'll be surprised that i respond in my mother tongue and i'll be like oh you still remember a chica and i'm like why not and they're like oh i didn't expect you to remember i'm like why not it's my language it's my language <laughs> And they're like, oh, not everyone does that. Some people don't speak it, so they lose it. I'm like, well, that's a choice they've made and power to them. Yeah. Yeah. Power to them for it. But for me, it's important that I keep roots there and I keep roots here. So mm. that at any one point, I am always bouncing off both. Mm. And I want to pass that on to my children. This is home. This is where we live. This is where we make friends. This is where we have a big family we do a massive family and when you go to uganda this is home this is where you have family this is where you have roots this is yeah. where you have a million brothers and sisters that you can't even name people won't understand it but just go with it like it's i find it so much fun by the way mm. it's so much yeah, it fun. is mm. you know you see, every time we get together i'm like wow we're so lucky we are so lucky to be able to do this thing together, you know, to be able to... It's a privilege. It is. <laughs> it really is. And, you know, you come from so many different backgrounds. One thing that fascinates me, um, Claire, is every time I think about the fact that me and Isma grew up in Kampala on the womb street, my mom knew his um, relatives, no, knows his relatives on the same street. We never met in Uganda. But we meet in Australia and get married. I'm like, what are the odds? Like, like we grew up on the same street, passing each other. 
but never met. And then in Australia, in this foreign land, in this merged family of community people, because you all come from Uganda, you meet someone, you get married, and then you're doing this thing together. And But your families already know each other. So you don't have to worry about that part of it. I think that, that's, that's something. No, that's... that's uh... That's really something. And, and I think it's, it's what misses here, like the whole communal aspect. Like mm -hmm. the way I see it, like, you know, the way they, this cons the, the society was constructed, it sort of like did not account much for the communal side of things. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the British are notorious for breaking up communities so mm. <laughs> I mean, this is this uh, you'd say this is not a, a a strong virtue for them like being in a community is not a a very strong thing for them they they prioritized individuality mm. and and like you're saying that like i appreciate those aspects like it's good but you you can't dismiss the the value of community it's mm. It, it it has so much to offer and uh, uh like there's some you know philosophy communities i'm i'm part of you find them talking about this it's like oh we need to like we need to bring back communal activities like really cultivate communities intentionally because they're finding that communal societies are are not suffering the things that individualistic societies are suffering. Like all these mental health crises are way less in communal societies mm. because I think of some of what you touched on there, like, you know, that, that sharing of that load, but also having, uh, you know, not being an island, basically. <laughs> you mm. know, like, like having, you know, the, the thing we, we started on, the who am I, right? Like in mm. a communal society, becomes very very uh clear because you have a lot of reinforcement you have a lot of mirroring from the other people you're engaging with who are confirming to you who yeah. you are and yeah. how you are being and mm -hmm. you're getting a lot of fast feedback from them every time you go slightly off from who you are <laughs> yeah. and, and so it really keeps you grounded because mm -hmm. um, when you when you're on your own there's you're not getting any of that feedback Mm. So you can you can forget who you are. And you just keep going, and really really get lost in some other stuff. Mm. And by, even if someone comes and finds you later, it's like yeah, you you you're a good case, like <laughs> like they like to say, right? Mm. But but we have that privilege where we come from, and and like you're saying, it's in the culture. I strongly believe it's because that's how we know how to be. Like we're more comfortable being in that way. Uh, you can't, like it's hard. You can't escape. You can't be f fully comfortable in yourself if you're not <laughs> in a communal yeah. setting. Yeah, if you're not yeah. connected, right? Mm. At the moment you're disconnected, it's way worse. Yes. <laughs> it feels <laughs> way worse. It feels so uncomfortable. And you're going like, mm -hmm. even if, even if you, because I remember like at the time when we, we moved here, we work for, 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 for this company and then the people we're working with just workmates, right? You meet them at the office, you work, you mm. go back to your home, you have your family, you have your car, whole other community thing going on. Mm. These people are just workmates, they're just colleagues. So here we are, the opportunities come and uh, we relocate, we relocate together, we're in the same city and all of a sudden, these are the only people you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah these are the only people you know than anyone mm. else mm. and now we slowly start to bond and try to make a community and make it work and it it wasn't you would say it wasn't like a flourishing community it wasn't like a a great community but it was something <laughs> mm. it was something better than not having it's like like, like instead of me just hiding in my cocoon and me like, I'd rather go and at least connect with these guys. I know they're just, we only really know each other from a work yeah. context, but, yeah. but I'm like, this is all that I have, right? Like, mm. I'll, I'll work with this. Mm. And 
over time, of course, you, you settle, you, you build other stronger relationships and, and so you, you find out, right? Like you, you, mm -hmm. you, 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 you expand your connectivity. Yeah. And then, then you're willing to sort of like <laughs> reduce on, on certain engagements and mm -hmm. focus more on the things which are working yeah, better. But, mm -hmm. but it's like, you still need that. You, you have to start somewhere. And it's like we are communal creatures. Without it, it's like we just don't know how to be. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot, there's a lot in there to go from. And I think even these children we're raising, the more like we get them into that, uh, you'd say that habit, that uh, that experience of being communal. Mm. You slowly start to see it rub off on them. You start to, yes. it, it gets to a place right now it's an expectation. It's like, oh, but I haven't seen, you know, like Shana <laughs> will, will be telling her friends like, oh, but I haven't seen my sisters. Like, wait, I, I thought you only have a brother. It's like, yeah, I also have sisters. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah? <laughs> you know, I haven't, I haven't seen my other people. I haven't, I, and, and for me, like every time I, she, you know, I see them doing that. Like it mm. gives me joy because I'm like, oh, so it's it's rubbing off. It's it's mm. working. So they're not going to lose the taste for that. They're not going to end up in a situation whereby mm. when life is boxing them in a corner and overwhelming them, like they, they just die with it by themselves. Mm. You know, they will they will okay. know to reach mm -hmm. out and go talk to people and go find their people. They will know to do that, which, which I think you're talking about with some of the other people who haven't grown up having that option. Mm. Uh, they don't know how they don't know how to yeah. like, express overcome the, the life struggle mm. when it, it presses down on them. They feel embarrassed about it. Mm. They, they, they feel like they should be winning this, like they should be overcoming these challenges by themselves and some like sometimes like uh, like what community really helps you to know is like yeah you're you you you're not big enough <laughs> you're not big enough yeah. you're not strong enough it's like connecting with other people is always going to be mm -hmm. bigger and stronger than you could do mm -hmm. on your own and so it like makes that really really clear to you uh, mm -hmm. but when you don't know that then all of a sudden you you make that assumption and you're like, oh, but I should be able to, right? I should be strong enough to deal with this. Mm. I, could, I should just be able to tell. Mm. And sometimes you can get carried away and do things that you go beyond where you should stop, right? Uh, but, but community gives you the boundary and the limits that you really mm. know who you are and where you stop <laughs> and yeah. when you need help and how you can how you can be helped it it, it really makes life much mm. more uh you'd say much more manageable yeah yeah <laughs> and you know i see the same in different cultures and and what i've what i think i've observed is down here there's i think it's a sikh temple um in Brackenridge, maybe if it's given there's a sikh temple it's got this big massive massive piece of land it's been like that for years as long as i've been in brackenridge this place has been there but what i've observed over the years is the number of people that actually go there they've got this like a hole and then all this empty land around it but you know at one point this this hole had trees around it but with time the trees are reduced and you see cars like many many cars and I've observed that this community has grown over the years. And can't you remember how we came about? I was talking to someone and, and they said, oh, no, you're going to notice a lot more sick in this community, in this area. And that's because mm. there's, there's a temple now. So everyone is going to want to be near the temple. So they will want to move to Brackenridge, to Fitzgibbon, to Aspley, so that they, they, they're around that community. That will be the heart of the temple and everyone will be drawn to it. So essentially, they're just going to expand. There'll be more children, more adults, more elderly, more people coming from wherever, and they'll just be, and that's who they are. And I thought, mm. wow, like, as Ugandans, we don't have that one uniting religion that would enforce that. Yeah. And I think I actually, not envied, but I was so happy for them to have that one 
thing that binds and again mm. i might be wrong and this is observation they might have more than one religion that i don't know about but this particular one has forced people to come together has made them choose to come together and i find in uganda because we've got that many now we're left with just the location uganda that's bring us together and mm. we are growing as well we are growing the number has gotten big i can remember a time even as recently as 7 years ago you went to a function and there were very few children there was zoe sofia phoenix like you could count the number of children that were there but now mm. zoe and sofia are more in your older range of children and the other little ones are just running around and becoming we become a big unit now and i yeah. look back and i'm like at the moment i would consider myself as one of the the veterans in the community in that i've been here long and i'm on the you know possibly the the older um age range and i can sit back and go are we really doing enough like are we mm-hmm. passing on enough to sustain when our children have children and i think obviously there's always room for better but i think we're doing really well in that regard as well we're doing well in you know the independence celebrations even if they're a pain to organize we're doing well in knowing that at easter we have to come together at christmas we have to do something during the school holidays you have to check on people even in the term you know when is the last time i saw my sister and then all of a sudden serena and amara are forcing us to see each other even though we've been busy with work so i think we could do a lot but for where we are i feel like they have they have things that are going off that are making them want more like they want to learn more of the language they want to say thank you in 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 our local dialect they want to know in uganda when i go to uganda where am i going to stay do they have this do they have that like will i will i have internet at home that's amazing will i be able to watch youtube i'm like yes you will but you went to church for five months i'm like yes you will. you know grandma and could have internet and they have all this but it's now trying to build that picture around uganda for them that it's never going to be a shock when they get there mm-hmm. and on the flip side sofia sofia knows what it's like so she's like i can't wait to go to uganda i can't wait to go to the zoo i can't wait to go to the garden with 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 granddad and do this and this i'm like okay so in the grand scheme of things i think i'm doing okay my children know you know she'll tell you a story about um ismail's home what she did when she was last there what she's looking forward to doing she's even asked to stay there longer i'm like okay oh. Okay. Yeah. No, I have no objection. It's how do you come back? But I just feel we need to all consciously tune into this agenda and and choose activities that are going to further everyone's children because it helps one, it helps all of them. All yeah. of them. You know, and it would be a bad place where I I teach Sophia something that I can't teach to Zoe. Mm. even if it's, they have two different cultures they need to know both they yeah. need to know a bit about islam they need to know a bit about catholicism they need to know you remember in school you had a friend who was a muslim you knew what ramadan was all about you knew the cultures without ever having read the quran you know yeah and you know you knew in the the batora do this and this the baganda do this the uh, the sebei do this and you came from school a wealth of information just from interaction yeah and and, and it's, it's interesting like thinking about it now it's like most of the things that i learned uh was through like you know the sst right <laughs> she just <Yeah>. studies <laughs> yeah. that's where all this information yeah. sort of like came to me and and i think we need we need to set something like that because also here like the schools here are going to teach whatever they are, they are shaping mm. the the people of here for um and so like you know when you are sharing that I'm, uh, like the, the 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 thought that was coming to me was oh wait and i think i've told fiana about this was like we need to organize more 
more of these events, like communal events. And and I was telling, uh, I don't remember who I was talking to at the at, at the ED celebrations, mm. uh, but I was saying something along the lines of, we, while we we like to do things for ourselves as a, a community, right? We mm. when we create events, uh, mm. like I think we've always created them for ourselves, uh, just you know the Ugandan community and just organize them just for that. But I've mm. I've thought about like why don't we just focus on creating good events which are repeatable probably open to the the whole public but more themed to our staff like our Ugandan things because we're the ones setting these up right uh I think uh Jonathan had mentioned something about you know what he he and Virginia were hosting for children mm-hmm. and I was saying mm-hmm. the same thing I was like yeah, yeah we we can keep doing it but now let's not just focus on just the Ugandans let's just open it up it's going mm. to it's going to be Ugandan content but for whoever wants to consume it and I think mm. that way uh, it allows us to expand our community in a way in that you have uh, you know people like you know our, our children's schoolmates who may be interested to learn more about uh, our mm. cultures and traditions they can come to some of these events and that will all you know, solidify the who we are, you know, who the children are and how we fit mm-hmm. and, and allow them to get to know even us better because they, they, they participate in our functions and events. And so it gives them that insight, but then also helps them develop a newfound respect for us and our cultures and traditions and how we show up, uh, which they, mm-hmm. they don't when they don't know. And I think... What, mm. yeah, like what we've done so far has been great, but I think that would be now the next step of like, yeah. okay, now let's start, let's start expanding it out a little bit. Yeah. So recently we had a, a leadership meeting and then we had a big discussion on children and there was talk about doing more activities, but you're right. I haven't heard it mentioned to be open now, but I think that's partly because even just for the few that we are, because this is a very much voluntary thing. I don't think there's been enough resource put into organizing just even something that would suit our own children. So I think Mm -hmm. there is a lot of potential in there. And while you're talking, the thought that came to mind is, you know what? There's really nothing stopping us from having something like a story time once a month. Someone picks a culture and a story and, you know, things we grew up on and just read it to the kids and share it. And, you know, take it as far as get a few parents to actually do some reenactment. You know, things like that, that would start to build a picture. So I think we do have, we have lots of different approaches and potential, but I think just the, the business of life is going to keep people from actually doing a lot more than they could. Yeah. Mm. And, 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 and part of this, like, you know, like setting up like a platform like this allows, mm. you know, opportunity to start doing some of these things like it doesn't always have to be like you know live in person we can always try and you know record Mm. even just a thing it's like okay here's a a story that you know one of us has told and and because it's coming from community members the community members are going to respond more are going to resonate more with that because it's from someone they know and things mm. like that. And so, like, I think those are some of the opportunities that we have that can actually strengthen our community and even allow it to move forward. Because I imagine, like, you know, years in the future, the Sophia's, the Delis are, are now going to be the ones running these communities, right? Like, have we, mm. have we shaped them? Have we put in place certain things that Mm-hmm. will become traditions later and say no you know like i know like uh, we celebrate independence every day it's like yeah yes but what else it's like 
what are those things that we do yeah. as a community that yeah. you know like strengthen us and and people are always looking for oh it's like oh yeah this uh usually every year uh, around this time we do this like okay it's kind of like now mm -hmm. going to auntie rest's house for easter is starting to become a thing it's like yeah that's what it's a, it's a thing that we do. So even next year, you don't even think about it. It's like yeah, we, we <laughs> cook food and go to Andres' house and we have this. It's like that's yeah. Easter tradition. And you know, like yeah. small things like that, even for, uh, you know, like the men in the side, it's like, okay, now Bashir with the running things, like, yeah, now that's a, it's a, it has become a thing. It's like, yeah, there's, <laughs> there's this running run? thing. Do they still run this Saturday? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's more... <laughs> So we try to get together, but sometimes people yeah. can't. But be, the, the intention is always, let's keep going. Mm -hmm. And so you have other people from even other communities st st trying to join in. Um, oh, but it's more like uh, it's, it's just a thing to get people together and do an activity. Mm. And so it's, it, it's slowly stabilizing and becoming a thing that People now look back on and say, oh, "Yeah, yeah, that we we do this. Mm. It's it's our thing that we do." And when mm. when it doesn't happen, people will be like, "Oh wait, well, why are we not doing this? This is what we're supposed to be doing." Mm. Like yes, setting so those, okay. yeah. So so building mm. the traditions intentionally, mm. I think is what we we need to invest in. Because I was asking Fiona, I was like, "Wait, what about the ladies? Do they also? Do you guys like get together and have like an event?" <laughs> You could you could do that and <laughs> you have you an opportunity. Yeah. You know, it's funny with, with us ladies because we have so many opportunities that we take it for granted. Mm. Like it's not unheard of to randomly have a video call. Like I feel we have you know, it's a video call here, it's a dash to shopping and everyone is invited, it's uh, one drink. So I feel us girls have hmm. this thing down pat, like we make opportunities. We, we thrive on those little get togethers that I don't know, like I find for me, it's a hundred percent stress relief. Hmm. You know, Fiona is cooking Kavalagala, I'll show up. Not because I'm desperate for Kavalagala, but it's the interaction. It's the, it's, a, it's, just a a step thing, away yeah. it's an event. I'm, it is an event. <laughs> So yeah. I feel, yeah, I remember when that running thing came up, I was really happy for the guys. I'm like, finally, something that takes them away. Others refuse yeah. to go, and that's their prerogative. But, you know, I'm like, at least there's something, you know. It, there's no need to feel isolated. Because I think, generally, it's a place where guys don't do too well, talking about how they feel and what's bothering yeah. them. Yeah, so I don't know, that one, I remember thinking, wow, what a great initiative. I hope it, it remains. We call mm. it men's conference. <laughs> when the girls talk about it, we're like, ah, oh, men's conference. So it, it's funny that um, it's, yeah, it's interesting that it's still there. I wish it would serve a bigger purpose, though, you know, because yeah. like, you know, the friend you had that was struggling with some things, that would be a place to talk about it. Yeah, yeah. Mm. No, I, and I think it's, it's it's gravitating towards that uh, mm -hmm. and having more of those kinds of, of uh, events. But but that's what I'm trying to point to. It's like, I think we need to sort of like formalize, not like in a formality way, but sort of mm -hmm. make it repeatable in an yeah. intentional way. Um, yeah. Because like, like things like, uh, like parenting, like, you know, like what we were speaking about earlier, being an in, in and between, you know, and the time is just coming to me now. It's like we are we are like in between people, right? <laughs> we're in between mm. cultures. Mm. Like we have, we sort of like have to take both sides of these cultures and traditions that we're dealing with, and make a new one. And mm. some of those things. Some of them will be like, we'll just copy paste from this side. Some of it will copy paste from that side. But it has to become like an intentional, repeatable thing that, mm. that sort of happens and, and sort of just grows and becomes its own trend. 
kind of like the way we do the independence thing. It's like mm. th- 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 that makes sense because you know there's a whole country, there's a whole debt, <laughs> there's a whole big story behind it. <laughs> yeah. Great. But there's many, there's many people in this in-between space dealing with all these problems of, you know, the who am I, the religion, the, you know, what do I do now? How do I balance this? And having, uh, you'd say, I don't like to use the phrase safe space, so I'm going to look for another word. <laughs> but having a place where you can go, mm. where other people are talking about similar stuff that you can mm-hmm. connect with and hear about the strategies they are they're applying mm-hmm. i think is a really like, like that can be a resource whereby we are growing from each other and yeah. using the strength of all the opportunities that we have sort of like been uh exposed to like leaning into the strength of all this you know, cultural bringing and now this exposure and strengthening each other and lifting each other up and, and encouraging everyone. So I think, I think that there's an opportunity there. <laughs> Definitely. And even it's, it's in the things we do, mm-hmm. our individual businesses, our individual side hustles that we can support one another in. Yeah. I find that's a place that is lacking because we have realtors, we have um, traders, we have cybersecurity, we have digital content, we have marketing, but I don't feel there's a one-stop hub that actually showcases all this skill. But we just, yeah. we, we roughly know, so we know to reach out to such and such, but I think that would be another place we can really be intentional. Yeah, I mean, it could be like mm-hmm. a market. Right, like you know, you're describing that, and I'm, and I'm imagining, uh, like you know, us blocking off a certain street or having like a playground somewhere mm. where people are just just came together and everybody has a stall. It's like, ah, oh, no, me, I do this, me, I do this, like a business day mm. where mm. everybody's just sharing about their, their, yeah. their business and showcasing, and and you'd be surprised that because we are all in the same community, we do actually want to take services from each other. Like, for example, we, we, we probably have a lot of, uh, you'd say, accountants in the community, right? Mm. Who, we, who we don't really take our every, tax, uh, tax, <laughs> tax returns to, right? You, you don't yeah. go to them, but, but like, like, why don't, why are we not doing that? Mm-hmm. You know, we have GPs in the community probably, and you're like, oh, if I knew there was a GP, I would mm-hmm. rather go to that. But even if they live the other side of the city, I would hey. rather go to that one because they will understand me better than mm. just any random GP. And so I think that opportunity there, I feel, mm-hmm. is what needs some closing. And, and, and the thing eating at me is like, how do, you, how do you start closing that gap in a small way? How do you how do you kind of like start to close it? And so, I know we'll see whatever comes up, but yeah. Yeah, but I think there's a couple of, of, of initiatives you can raise with Bashila as well. Like mm. I know they're always looking for tasks and activities to do and, and you know, small things to get the uh, community engaged. But as you might observe, they, I feel like the community on the north side is more interested in the communal work. So, yeah, yeah, but we have so much opportunity and we just need to step out of our day, our busy day, and do it. But I'm yeah, going to talk to someone about at least starting story time. Even if we could get a whole bunch of stories, we just tell, even when we get together, just one story or two stories. Mm. Yeah. That's small. Yeah, yeah. Mm. I, I'm up for it. I would vote for that project. <laughs> okay, I, I, will, I will raise it with Charlotte and see. <laughs> Yeah, no, mm. actually Charlotte had some projects she wanted to run. She wanted to set up like yeah. an event where, you know, people get together and sort of like do reviews of culture or something. Mm. And so I think I think we can do that. And and I think it's a great opportunity that will strengthen us and even grow us and like set it up for the next 
the the next guys because like you know the older you're getting you start to go like yeah i'm probably not going to be around forever <laughs> that's it and, and yeah. well if i go back my analogy of my budding face now i feel i'm in my bloom hmm. but i am midway through my blooming phase so that now i have to start and I'm, I'm not being morbid or anything it's not that i tend to be away from this earth for the ne in the next 30 40 years but i want it to be that when I'm, i leave there is a sense of missing but i've yeah. passed on what i feel i needed to i've done my part yeah and i feel that's where we are now we have children we have to mold them we have to set them we have to prepare them for that point where we're not there and then they have to go through their own phase mm -hmm. so i i actually like being able to think about a time when i'm not there and what that will mean for my kids because mm -hmm. that's another thing in our culture we're not yeah. brought up to do we're brought up to fear death and you know you just don't want to talk about it you don't want to write a will but that's one thing i, I challenged i'm like i'm not mm -hmm. going to be blindly assuming that i won't die soon or i couldn't die young god forbid but i wanted to be that the missing me is purely an emotional sentimental thing but it's not a knowledge gap or it's not a financial one i want that to be that that stress to be lessened yeah mm. now um that that completely resonates with me because like even doing this podcast is all part of that project of you know it's like we can't let our all these wise lessons just kind of like just go <laughs> right mm -hmm. at least let's capture them somewhere uh and who knows uh when these ones grow up later they too can mm -hmm. maybe look at them who knows <laughs> you know i keep thinking about what life is going to be like in the next 10 20 years and sometimes I think how we used to have cassettes and you had your mix on there. Mm? Then we had CDs and we had a mix. Then there were DVDs and the USB and the iPod. Now we're doing this and they'll look back and go, wow, that technology was so old. I know. You, know, <laughs> you guys thought you were cool doing podcasts and video recordings and and then they'll turn around maybe they won't even be playing it in this format that fascinates yeah. me i'm like oh wow yeah. if we're lucky we'll be around to watch them and watch it change and be like back in my day you know we had TikTok, we had yeah. you know, youtube <laughs> I'm like, oh my goodness <laughs> so yeah I, I think it's good i think i think i want to be in a place where i can send my kids somewhere to listen to something that speaks about who I was on my journey in Australia. Mm. And, you know, mm. I never thought it would be in this format, but at least there's something, you know? Yeah, yeah better enough. something than nothing, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, when they're old enough to appreciate it. You know, who, who knows? Like, I love how I will randomly listen to something and only one sentence will make sense and the rest won't. And that's okay too. I love that our humanity and intelligence has evolved so much that I don't have to listen to all 96 minutes of this. I might just catch it in the middle, catch like snippets here and then, and I'm done. I, I get yeah. the message for the day. So yeah, yeah do it. <laughs> mm. no, that's good. Minutes, uh, okay? 96. Oh, wow. <laughs> I think that's that's a good place to wrap it up. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much and always good talking to you. Yeah, thanks Paula for joining me once again and we'll talk on the next one. <laughs> okay. Have a good one. Cheers. Bye-bye.